Good day, everyone, everywhere, and special greetings to all those seated in heavenly places in Yeshua, our Messiah. Uh, the name of this program is Cross the Border, and what we're doing every day here is going through the Bible, the Scripture, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. And last time uh, we left off in uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, about chapter 6 and verse 14. So we started to get into that a little bit. Uh, one scripture which uh, many people know. Uh, most uh, Many people have it memorized. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Very good questions there. We are called to be in the world and not of it. Another affirmation of this scripture. Uh, many affirmations of this throughout the, the Old and New Testament. We are, not uh, we are not supposed to bring in the practices of the heathen, the unbelievers, and our congregations into our households. We are to be separate from the world. That's what the word, if you take the word holy, it means separated, set apart. So we are commanded, and yes, this is a commandment, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And of course, the illustration is to be yoked which uh, most people don't have much of a clue of what that means since uh, nobody, uh, hardly anyone ever sees a yoke anymore. But a yoke they would use on chariots or you could use them on a carriage or to pull a plow when you have several animals together. And an unequal yoke would be, uh, say, a pony with uh, a draft horse. That would be an unequal yoke because you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, it's just going to pull you in circles. Now you have to have two animals that are of fairly the same size, strength, and uh, that can do fairly the same job that will pull equally together. When you yoke someone with, with when you yoke two animals, you need to yoke them equally. If you are unequally yoked, uh, the job doesn't get done and uh, both animals go off course. So you don't think, don't think for a minute by yoking yourself with an unbeliever that you're somehow going to save the unbeliever. All the unbeliever is going to do is pull you off course and you're going to lose your straight and narrow furrow. You're going to lose sight of the object that keeps you on the straight and narrow. That's what we get by being unequally yoked. So in marriage, of course, for our young people, we need to teach them. Uh, fathers and mothers need to reinforce this with their daughters, that they only marry by permission of the mother and father. Now, however, if you send your children to the public fool system, where they will learn the idolatry of romance, if you let them watch the sitcoms, where the idolatry of romance is celebrated and all the popular movies and over and over they see the idolatry of romance. Now, many times it's unavoidable. Many times, sometimes because many movies will always have an element of romance in them. It's part of their sales. They have to have romance in every movie. You'll notice some romantic element to appeal to the populace. And sometimes it's unavoidable to, to route out every element of uh, the idolatry of romance out of your lives and, and to protect your children from that. I mean, you can do something, like you can uh, rule your television set by not allowing the sitcoms into your house and watching the movies that you do if you watch movies with your children. Uh, explain to them the romantic elements and caution them against them. And fathers, when your daughters are young, let them know that you intend to 
well, let's see, authorize their marriage and to get a promise from them that they will not marry without your permission. And the mothers need to reinforce that. However, now if you have a husband and wife that are not unequally, that are not equally yoked, one is going to be pulling for romance and the other is going to be pulling for the law of God and obedience to that law. And you can see what's going to happen to the children. So how important it is to be equally yoked. Continuing on here, and what agreement, so we're talking about agreements, and what concord in verse 15, so we're talking about concordats, that's a type of agreement. What concord has Christ with Belial, the word concord. Let's see, what do we got here for this word concord? Accordance. What accordance do we have? And that's, that's all our good friend Strong gives us on this one word, is accordance for a uh, concord. So what accordance? has Because uh, we do things according to his law, and they do not. Belial does not do things according to the law of God. So you have an unequal yoke there. What agreement? We have no agreements. We don't, we don't enter into contracts. We don't... We don't allow, you know, so, and I have to draw again the illustration of the socialist security contracts and all of these insurance contracts that people sign out there. You're unequally yoking yourself with unbelievers. You're having one purse with them. And to draw an illustration on the insurance, they say that uh, about 8% of your insurance premium goes for the administration and the payment of claims. 8%. The question is, where does the other 92% go? What is your labor paying for? See, you're paying for wherever that other 92% go. Now, the people that enjoy these riches, this 92% profit, uh, of course, sanctioned by the government, as a matter of fact, mandated for all of theirs. If you are a resident, if you belong to the world, then you are mandated to get those. And then there, of course, are many people who call themselves Christians that participate in those things unquestioningly, ignorantly walking into the trap, into the snare, the fowler snare. So we're not much wiser than a bird that walks into the net because it sees bird seed. <laughs> is, that, is that what we're like? Yes. Oh, man. But what is that? what are they using that money for? In whatever they're using it for, to destroy your nation, to promote sin, to promote homosexuality, to promote the redefinition of marriage, to promote a new sign for the rainbow. Remember, the rainbow was a sign given to us by God of his covenant with man, that he would never destroy man off the face of the earth as he did during Noah's flood. It was a sign of his covenant with mankind. But it, now it's been redefined. Now the rainbow means, oh, homosexuality is gay. Oh, we're gay. We're, so, we're colorful people. Yes. And they, well, they stole the word gay too. And now they want the word marriage. That's right. Well, my, my answer to them and the whole marriage issue is, to, uh, is for godly men and women to withdraw to not buy the license. You already have your license. It's called the Holy Bible. In, this, in the pages of that book, God gives men and women license to marry according to his law. So if you marry according to his law, his book, because he is the supreme lawgiver, his book is all the license you need. You don't need to go to the state unless you want benefits from the state. But why would you trade his benefits for the benefits of an image made by men? Because that's what the state is. It's an image made by men because it only exists in the minds of men. Yes, the land is real. And we designate certain areas of land, uh, you know, by a name. We say that this, does, this area of land is called California. And the land is different from the state of California. The state of California is a corporation. And corporations are fictions or images created by men and they only exist in the minds of men. If all men cease to exist, 
the image of the state of California would cease to exist because it only exists by the imagination, because there's another word, the root word of imagination is image. It only exists in the imagination of men. And that we share this image, um, you know, does that make it more real? No, we do not worship images unless we obey them. If we say, well, you know what, I read God's Bible and uh, God won't give me a license to marry. So, I reject the law of God, and I reject the word of God, and I reject his word because, you know, this man wants to take this man to be his, huh, how does that work? Are they two husbands? <laughs> oh, it's not funny, but it's just, it's just hilarious. Uh, that, you know, what is wrong with these people's brains? They are brain damaged. Well, it's, so anyway, they go to their image, the image which is given life, they give life to the image and it breathes and it speaks and it gives them laws because they hire men and pay them hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to write new laws for the image and then they have their high priests of the image that, uh, and that decree unjust decrees and they, uh, they legislate wickedness and they give people licenses. Eh, well, you know, now I live on the land in California and they've got their state, you know, all their people that comprise and give life to the image over here. And uh, they've been going back and forth with the whole marriage issue, rede redefinition. And, and I think this last time they just said, you know what, the people have spoken and uh, we don't want to become that unpopular because the people keep reversing it over and over uh, by vote, although not by much. But you get the idea. If people can't get license from the scripture, they turn to images and they worship the image of the beast. And of course, by obeying, by accepting its laws over the law of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, but they seek first the kingdoms of men and images or a, an image of God's government created on earth. And, uh, but an image that twists or rejects the law of God. What concord has Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? So talking about taking part in these things. How about if you get a license from the state? Are you not becoming one with the state? Are you not becoming unequally yoked? Their law proclaims that the state is the third party head of your marriage if you get a marriage license. It isn't just the man and the woman getting married under the law of God. You can do that without a state license because God already gives you license. Take your Bible, go to your pastor, and, or if you want to get married in a church, or go to the go to the bride's father, say, marry us. And he may delegate that authority uh, for his ceremony to the church because the father has that right to delegate. But really, marriage, the institution of marriage, the ceremony of marriage, by scripture, is a family right. And I mean R-I-T-E as in ritual, because right, R-I-T-E is short for ritual. So marriage is a family right. Just study your scripture. Go, go through your scripture all the way from, you know, beginning to the end and you'll find that marriage is a family right. And fathers should be instituting the marriage in the family. The father of the bride should have the feast. It was always because he was giving the bride away. And that's the pattern we see in the scripture. I guess there doesn't really have to be any hard, fast rule. Uh, but uh, speaking specifically for young people, because most most people that get married and then should stay married for the rest of their life, uh, at least uh, they should be the young people, and the father should be giving the bride away. Instead, they turned it over to the state. The state becomes the third party head of the marriage by law, by the state law, and of course, then you get into the legal issues and you find out, well, that's why the CPS can come in and take your children because they really own them by contract. 
you have signed a concord with the state. You have signed an agreement with them. You have unequally yoked yourself because the state is an image. So if you're not allowed to marry outside the faith or your denomination or whatever, you're supposed to be equally yoked in that. Well, how do you yoke, you yoke yourself to an image the third, and make it the third party head of your marriage? And that's all the poor little homosexuals want. They want equal rights. Well, you know what I think? I think only the homosexuals need a license from the state to marry because they can't get one from God. God Almighty will never recognize their marriage union. So only the homosexuals, only the adulterers, and only the disobedient to the law of God need a license from the state because the state is their God. They've rejected the Word of God. Now we're getting a little deep into be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So there's many ways that people, we just go along. We don't question anything. We don't look to the Word of God. How many of you prayed, Oh, Heavenly Father, should I sign up for Social Security? Well, should I get this job? You know, well, yeah, go get the job. Go work. Work for your bread. If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. But a wise man looks well into his ways. And if they say, oh, but before you do that, you have to do this. You have to commit this crime before you can do the good thing. Well, oh, well I want to do the good thing, so I have to commit the crime, don't I? Now, the ends do not justify the means. We should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The unfortunate thing is that most people will not stand up for what's right. They will allow themselves to be coerced into volunteering because you all volunteer if you had to sign on the dotted line you volunteered if it's mandatory you wouldn't have to volunteer that's right if you went to work they could just assign you an employee number well your employee number 339 don't forget that number because that's how we we identify you on the job but they don't assign you a number you have to apply for it and sign your name to the contract, making them your benefactor and making you their ward. That's right. You declare yourself incompetent to administer your own financial affairs. And that's what it's all about. How's that for being unequally yoked? You put pagans in charge of your financial affairs for your life because you say, well, Golly, I just, what am I going to do if I get old? And, you know, I can't trust in God. Uh, yeah, I know the Bible says forget none of his benefits, but gee, I don't remember him because, you know, my pastor never preached it to me. Never told me about God's benefits, how he'll take care of me all my life, and that if I seek first his kingdom, that everything I need will be added to me. And that doesn't end when you're 65. That doesn't end if you become disabled. That doesn't end if your spouse dies. He said, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and everything that all these things will be added to you. Of course, he was speaking about what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What, wherewithal am I going to be clothed? Where, how am I going to be housed? He said, after all these things, do the nation seek. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You don't have to be unequal, yoked with unbelievers. I will take care of you. And then, in, uh, after all of that about being unequal, yoked and having no concord or agreements and contracts and with the, with the images and with unbelievers and having one purse with them, uh, let us all have one purse. Cast in your lot with us. Yes, help us pay to murder innocent people. Help us uh, fund the destruction of your nation by the profits that you're going to give us. Come, let us all have one purse. Let us be unequally yoked. It will benefit you greatly. Are you being bribed into capitulating and going against the law of God? Absolutely. We'll be back in a few minutes and we'll continue here in 2 Corinthians. Visit CrossTheBorder.org 
C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the truth about God's chosen people and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, we're back. You're listening to Cross the Border. I'm Nicholas, and my website is crosstheborder.org. So uh, make sure you uh, check that out when you get a chance. Uh, we're continuing the study here in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. So we got to uh, about verse 16, 17. Oh, yes. Wherefore come out from among them? We're talking about being unequally yoked with unbelievers. All the entanglements of the world. I mean, I've just spent a, quite a bit of time on three verses, and, and last time we spent some time on the same three verses. Uh, this is, there are so many traps out there. We, we grow up in the world, in the land where I live. We have corporate churches that are entangled in the world fully, unequally yoked with unbelievers. And I've been speaking on a personal level, but you get to the... Uh, the corporate level or the body of Christ, uh, such as it is, or the congregation has now become entangled with the image and completely caught up in it and uh, the worship of the image. Because that's what it is when you obey the image. Obedience is worship. I'm sorry, there's just no other way to put it. Um, because what is it? You know, we've relegated terms like worship to such vague uh, definitions. Most people think of worship, they think of uh, uh, singing a song and raising their hands and you know all of that is an expression of worship. But if you're singing the songs and the congregation and raising your hands and swooning to the music and tears running down your eyes but you're not being obedient to the Heavenly Father, if you're not living a life that is pleasing to Him, then what is it worth? It's absolutely nothing. All it is, is a bunch of physical motion. That's right, it's just motion. You're like grass in the wind. That's, that's the significance of it. Nothing. And perhaps it's even worse than that. Because at least the grass in the wind is not a deception. <clears throat> but if you're putting on like you're worshiping God and singing songs, and it makes you feel good, you feel emotional about it, but you're not living a life of obedience to Him. You're unequally yoked at every turn. 
accepting license from the state, perhaps practicing birth control and abortion and homosexuality and whatever else the state will allow you, and you're going to stand before God one day and say, well, the state of California said it was okay. It wasn't against the law. <laughs> He's going to say, but it was against my law, and you knew in your heart you knew it was wrong, but you accepted license from another God because you wanted to fulfill and satisfy the lusts of your flesh rather than be obedient to me. Thought you could justify it because another God gave you license. And that's what it is. Another God, another authority. You put another God or lawgiver before him. That's the first commandment. Thou shall have no other gods before me. Your God is your lawgiver. You want to relegate that to nothing. You want to define that as, oh, who, I, I, never, I never go up to Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and, and raise my hands and sing songs and tell him how great he is and, and emotionally swoon. And I haven't built a, a statue of him and I don't pray to him. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, you know, you wish that's all it meant. That if you're not doing those things, you're okay. No, you have other gods before him. Your God is your lawgiver. Do you worship the image? Do you obey the image? Or do you worship the true God and live by his law? Who do you repent to? Oh, well, how many people repent to the state? Uh, yeah, they repent to the state when the policy enforcers come out and throw them in jail. I didn't mean to do it. I'll never do it again. You know, just, but you know, the... Our Heavenly Father said that he gave us the civil government to punish evildoers. So when they're punishing evildoers, they're doing their job. But we are never to worship them. Their job is to punish evildoers. When they go beyond punishing evildoers, they have stepped outside of the authority that God has given them. And the whole Romans 13 thing, you know what Paul writes about government? That's instruction for government. This is government in its proper authority. It doesn't mean that we obey the government no matter what. It means that as long as it walks in its proper authority, that it is, it is authorized by God, the governments of men. When it steps outside of those boundaries, then it is, it is tyrannical. It is disobedient, of course. Then we talk about license, contrary to the will of God. So, wherefore, because of these things that we've been talking about, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. So, you know what? That means that we have to take action. We need to examine everywhere that we are unequally yoked with unbelievers, everywhere we have communion with darkness, everywhere we have a concord with Belial, we do things according to, not Christ, but the idol idolatry of the world, you know, so like romance versus, uh, you know, agape. Uh, everywhere we have an agreement with idols, images, things that are contrary to his word and his law, we need to examine our lives and go through all of these things because here's the instruction. Wherefore, because of all these things, now we've searched into our lives and, and we're working in every, everything we do, every aspect of our life, as we go through our life day by day, we examine everything that we do. Most people don't want to do that. Most people think, well, I've been doing it for years. My parents did it. Therefore, it must be okay. And certainly God will understand. You know, it's like certainly God understands why I can't keep his law. That's right, because I'd lose my job. Well, my parents did it, and what would my parents think if I stopped celebrating Ashtaroth? Huh? If I didn't, if I didn't get my little children Easter Bunny baskets with little plastic grass and stuff on Easter and chocolate bunnies, what would my parents think? Oh, the deprivation of my children. How could I deprive them of being bribed with candy to continue in idolatry? So because of all these things, examine, that's what I'm saying, examine everything, every aspect of your life, every agreement, every check or payment you make, where is the money going? Are you funding godliness? 
is there a 92% profit when you, when you send out that check to the insurance company? What are they spending that 92% profit on? It only takes 8% to administer and pay the claims. Wow, where does the other 92% go? And why was it legislated that you volunteer or suffer the consequences? <laughs> you, you volunteer under threat and, and duress. And most people just give in to the threat and duress. And what are they funding? And then this, you pay all those, you sign up, you'd make this, the state the administer of your financial affairs. They give you an identification number. And they take all your hard-earned labor. And what do they fund with it? Abortions in Mexico. Oh, neat. Wow. Is that what you're laboring for? Is that what you're working 30 to 40 percent of the time that you go out and labor and work for? How about funding all of the deaths in Afghanistan and Iraq? Because of the weapons of mass destruction. Oops, there was no weapons of mass destruction. Oh, golly, I just, you know, oh, it was a terrible thing that we went over there and killed all those people on a lie. But, hey, I'll spend 30 per 40 percent of my labor to fund that. Why not? And how about teaching the children uh, homosexuality? Let's have gay day in school. You, know, you like funding that too? Be not unequally yoked. Wherefore, come out from among them. That means stop doing it. You know, withdraw, repent, and don't go back when they come to you and go, you must. You say, well, I have repented. Uh, I'm standing on my religious liberty. Uh, Yahshua said I would be like a dog returning to its vomit and uh, putting my, my, the eternal disposition of my soul uh, forever depends on the the stand I make. Will I deny Christ? Will I deny his law out of fear for man? If the scripture says, fear not them that can kill the body, well, they haven't, they haven't threatened to kill me yet, so they've only threatened to throw me in jail, or they only threatened to fine me, or they only threatened to take my job away, they only threatened to stop me and take my automobile as I'm driving down the highway, all these things. But they haven't threatened me with death, so I guess I can go along. No, it means anything up to and including the threat of death. Anything less is not excluded. It means even up to and including the threat of death. Fear not them that can kill the body, but fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. So when he says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Does that mean he'll reject you if you're a coward? Well, you know, the scripture does say that, that cowards, will, it, cowards are listed as the people that will be outside of the kingdom. No cowards will be entered in. I mean, if, you, if we're not to fear death itself, how do we fear losing our job because we're withdrawing, we're coming out and being separate? How do we, if we're not to fear death, how do we fear being stopped by a policy enforcer and having our automobile taken because we can't, can't, won't go along? Why, why do we volunteer when we know that even the law says we have a right to travel. It's only the fact that so many people have capitulated out of fear that has emboldened them to trample the rights of the rest of us who will stand for our, the rights we are supposed to have. And we can absolutely stand on religious liberty. Absolutely. But we're afraid. Everybody is afraid. But the scripture is clear. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, 
Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die and to live with. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come to, unto Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. And you know, notice here, Paul talks about uh, the tribulations the, that they have to endure. He says that, I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. So regardless of what goes on, he has that joy. And of course, that joy that no one can rob him of. That joy that will be fulfilled when his mortality ends. We have that assurance of immortality in Christ and all the promises of God. And we can take joy in that when every other happiness and every other enjoyment of life has been stripped away. No one can take that from us. And he says, For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. So there's, there was a lot, there was a lot of uh, tribulation, a lot of uh, tumult in the land. Without were fightings. And he said, Within were fears. And here's Paul expressing fear. Are you afraid? Yes. There are many times I'm afraid. And fear is a gift from God. It really is. I believe that fear is a gift from God. You know, if we walk up to a cliff and it's a hundred feet down, well, we should fear what's going to happen if we fall off that cliff or jump off. Fear can be a healthy thing. Fear can keep us out of trouble. Fear can make us go around trouble. Wise man sees trouble coming and he hides himself. Fear. That's what fear is. You see the trouble coming, you're afraid, so you hide yourself. Fear is a healthy thing. But cowardice is something else. Cowardice is when fear controls you. We're not controlled by fear. We don't capitulate to fear. We don't allow use people to you to we don't allow people to use fear to control us because that's called cowardice. That's what cowardice is. Cowardice is de determined by what you do when you are afraid. Do you do the right thing? Well, then you're not a coward. Yes, you were afraid, but you're not a coward. If you do the wrong thing, if you capitulate, you say, well, you know, I have to do what they say because I'm afraid of them more than I'm afraid of God especially when they require you to break the law of God or become unequally yoked with unbelievers. That's, that's a commandment. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. So Paul expresses fear here. He said, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus, that he comforts us in our fears if we're obedient. If we're not obedient, well, we're looking for our comfort from the one that uh, is coercing us with fear. Ah, oh, I'm comforted now. Yes, I paid off, you know, I paid off the protection racket people, you know. That's, is, is it right or is it wrong? Is it right to just pay them off so they'll leave you alone and then move on and tyrannize the next man to rob from him? To steal from him? Is it better to stand up against the evil, even if you are afraid? Well, everyone has to make their own decision, and uh, I hope you make the right one. I wish more people would stand up and say, I have a right to obey the law of God before the law of man. And they have a law, you know. 
the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America says they have they cannot require me to go against my sincerely held religious convictions, especially when the book of the law of God, the Holy Bible, proclaims, and I'm trying to live by God's law above man's law. I have a religious liberty, and they say I have a right to that religious liberty, so that's where I make my stand. Now, for all of those, all of the pagans out there, well, you know, what are they going to stand on? They have no other right. They, they can't stand on the First Amendment because they're pagans and because uh, they're atheists. Atheists have absolute... Athe atheism is stupidity. You have no rights under atheism. You have no religious liberty under atheism because you have no religion. You have no God to whom you have to account above the laws of men. So in effect, if you're an atheist, the state is your God because it's the highest authority and lawgiver in your life. So those of us that proclaim that we are God's people, that we are the people of the book, are you the people of the book? That we are the people of the book. You know what, that, maybe I'll just call myself, I am the people of the book. I am of the people of the book. This is my book. This is my book of the law. This is the book that I live by. I am the people of the book. You know, are you one of the people of the book? And their law says that my book, I can stand on it, on my right, as, a, as one of the people of the book of the law of God, and say, this law says I can't obey that, your law, and I'm standing on it. Now, if we all would stand like that, they would not feel so emboldened, would they? But it is because most people who call themselves Christians don't stand. They capitulate. They say, oh, you know, I can't pay any attention to the book. Remember, the law was nailed to the cross, so I guess I have to obey the laws of men, even if the law of God, which was nailed to the cross, no wonder they have indoctrinated you thus. Because they want you to put man's law, their law, above God's law. No wonder they have gone into the seminaries and, and taught all of the people seeking careers in ministry that the law of God was nailed to the cross. Because if the law of God was nailed to the cross, then that means the only law we have left is whatever law... Man, that means all of you Christians out there who believe the law was nailed to the cross, well, you have to accept homosexuality because God's law doesn't matter. If God says that a man can't lie with a man as a man does with a woman, that it's an abomination, well, we can't pay attention to that because the law was nailed to the cross. So now we have to embrace the homosexuals. You can see where it's going. You can see where it leads. So... That's what I say. If you believe that the law was nailed to the cross, then you have to embrace the homosexuals. Then you, you must insist that your pastor marry Joe and Steve. And abortion, the church cannot speak against abortion because the law of God was nailed to the cross. So abortion is A-OK -okay because man's law, which is now the highest law since God's law was nailed to the cross, that makes man's law the highest law of the land. So abortion is okay now. Adultery is a good. You're listening to Cross the Border. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stay tuned for the news. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now.
The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Across the Border, that's the name of this program, and we're going through the Bible here, uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we've ended up in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and let's see, uh, yes, uh, about verse uh, 6, nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus, Paul getting into more personal issues here and not by his coming only, but by us, by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world worketh death. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. And what is the work of repentance? You know, the sorrow. Many people think that the sorrow is the repentance. I feel really bad about that. And they think the feeling, because most people have relegated so much to feelings. When the feelings accompany, you know, like feelings accompany love and feelings, they're, they're emotions, I should say, that accompany love. Emotions that accompany hatred. And there's emotions that accompany repentance. But just having the emotion is not enough. Unless the work accompanies the emotion, then it's just an empty emotion. And many people are hooked on emotions. And they, they just want to feel something. And they wonder why they can't feel something. It's because the works aren't there. And the work is repentance. And that's what Paul says here. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. So repentance is a work. If the work of repentance doesn't follow the godly sorrow, then there is nothing to it. But he says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance 
to salvation. So what do you have before salvation? Well, you have godly sorrow, feeling something's wrong, and, you know, I really am sorry that I've done what I've done, and, and of course, that means that I don't want to do that anymore. And then the work of repentance is to do that which is right and to stop doing that which is wrong. You got First Corinthians, I believe it's First Corinthians ten thirteen, which says that there is no sin that has taken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, or there is no temptation, I should say, has taken you. It's sin when it takes you. Uh, but with every temptation, he provides a way of escape. So the work of repentance is looking for the way of escape rather than falling into the same error over and over again or continuing to practice the error as the world does because they don't consider it a sin. Uh, they delight in their error. They delight in their sin. To them it's okay to continue to practice it over and over and over and they have no godly sorrow working repentance because they continue to practice. But if you could re continue to practice after you have sorrow over it, then there is no repentance. The repentance is when you're looking for that way of escape that God provides with every temptation. And that, of course, the way of escape is obedience to him. Okay? You don't want me to do this? What do you want me to do? And you get busy about his business instead of the business of uh, whatever it was that you were doing. You know, it's like Yahshua says, if, you're, if your eye offends you or causes you to sin, or causes you to fall into sin, then pluck it out and cast it from you. you know, so it's talking about this stupid TV set and the sitcoms. Don't just sit there and allow your families to watch that stuff. Don't just let this set that ungodly filth before your eyes. Get up and turn the thing off. That's right. And tell your family, say, this does not honor God. We will not allow this on the television anymore. But if you can't control it, well, you know, perhaps uh, throw the darn television out. You know, pluck it out. Get rid of it if it causes you to sin. Godly sorrow leads to the work of repentance. Worketh repentance to salvation. And you should be afraid. What will happen if you don't repent? Well, let's look at the sentence here. Second Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow, that's first. Worketh repentance, that's second. To salvation, that's third. And that's not to be repented of. Yeah, you don't repent. You know, oh, well, you know what? Uh, 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 you know what? The, the, the government said that, you know, they, they took my car away. And, and you know, I have to go down and now, you know, uh, sign up and, and make ungodly covenants with the ungodly. And I have to cast in my lot with them and have one purse with them because, well, they persecuted me. So I repent of my repentance. <laughs> or, or, or just the pressure on me was too great. Oh, yes. My family, you know, they couldn't live without watching. Let me try to think of the name of one of those crazy, stupid, ungodly programs on the television set, the sitcoms. You know, uh, Heather has to... Oh, no, that's a book <laughs> that they push in the public school system. Um, uh, two Men and a Boy or something like that. Uh, some, some terrible ungodly programs they have out there, sitcoms. I can't even think of the names of any of them. I, I haven't allowed them on my television set for so many years that I don't even know them anymore. All I know is that I don't want to watch them. And I certainly don't want my family, especially my children, to see them. But oh, oh, the pressure was too great and for my wife and my children. And, and they just couldn't live without two men and a boy without watching that program every week. So I repented of not allowing them to watch it. I repented of my godly sorrow that led to repentance. And oops, guess what happens after that? Well, it's, it worketh repentance to salvation. So we're not to repent of our godly sorrow that works repentance because it leads to salvation says, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So your, ch your choice here is salvation or death. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know, I stood up to my family and my children because I feared what would happen if I didn't take a stand, if I couldn't 
be a man and say, God's law rules in this household. And we will set no evil thing before our eyes. There are plenty of good things a family can do together. And you know what? When, a, when the parents take a stand, a, a stand for godliness and God's law, that's what their children learn to do. That's what your children will learn from you. That you either stood or you capitulated. And you know what? Then when they have children, you know what they'll do? Well, they'll, they'll stand if you stood. Or they'll capitulate if you capitulated. Or they may get up and curse you for your cowardice. And they may curse you in hell. When you're all there together, they may curse you for your cowardice in hell. That may be part of your punishment forever, being cursed by your own children. Hell is not going to be a pleasant place. Hell is going to be the withdrawal of everything good. Because remember what the Heavenly Father said? From those who have, more shall be given. And from those who have not, even that which they have shall be taken away. All the good that God gave you, if you don't multiply it, if you don't use it for his kingdom, to increase his kingdom, because his kingdom, all good things come from God, then even that which he gave you will be taken away. No good thing in hell. Hell will be the absence of everything good. And you know what I fear for those that are going there? That it will be the presence of everything evil that they imagined. It will be the presence with the consequences simultaneously of all the evil that they created in their life while they shielded themselves and clothed themselves with the gift of God, that good in their life, and said, I'm a good man. And they attributed all the good that God gave them to themselves. And they stand there before God, I'm a good man. God won't let me go to hell. But they have not added a thing. Even that which they have shall be taken away. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You should fear if you're not if godly sorrow is not working repentance in your life. You should fear. Work out your fear. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You should fear what will happen to you. Hell, the withdrawal of everything good and the existence only of the evil and the consequences forever. Oh, that's, that's a fearful thought. There's a little hell fire and brimstone for you. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world worketh death. The sorrow of this world worketh death. You know, the Esau, Scripture says, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. And the Scripture says that Esau sought it bitterly with tears, but no place was found for it. Speaking of repentance, he had, he had a, the sorrow of the world. And I believe that he was sorry because of his immediate loss. Because he lost the birthright. He cried. He wept bitterly. When, when, uh, when his father, when Isaac, his father said, I've already made your brother your master. I have no blessing left for you. I gave everything to your brother Jacob. He was very sorrowful. But there was no place found for repentance. Because Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What was the difference between the two men? Jacob was after God. Jacob's life was about his creator. But Esau's life was only about Esau and his mortal existence. He cried for his loss. Not that he displeased the Heavenly Father. There was no place found for repentance, though he sought it bitterly with tears. He had the sorrow of this world. We'll continue here with Paul and 2 Corinthians, his letter to the Corinthians, he says, Before, be, For behold, this selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. What carefulness it wrought in you? Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. 
Oh, what zeal! Yea, what revenge! In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Of course, Paul perhaps talking about a specific matter, a specific sin that, propped, that cropped up in the congregation and they repented. And look, look what he says. You sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought. How careful are you about your life and the things you engage in and, and the yokes that you yoke yourself in, the things that you teach your children, that you allow your children to be taught by pagans in the public fool system for, because you don't have time, because you're pursuing mammon, or because the wife wants that free time for herself. Oh, that's my time to clean the house. And, you know, my, that's my time to go out shopping and do the things that I do. And, and after all, isn't the state offering me free babysitting service? And I don't want to be bothered with my children. I need my free time. God gave you those children. Repent. Bring them home. Stop being selfish. What carefulness. Are you careful? How careful are you? Are you careful with your children? You sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yes, you need to be careful about everything in your life. You need to be careful about every decision you make for your children, for your household. You need to be careful. We need to be careful. We've been careless. Oh, we just go along. Oh, they said I had to do this. Oh, I did it without a sign on the dotted line. Oh, oh yes. I, I just, they said that I have to send my children to kindergarten. Oh, oh preschool. Oh, they're teaching them homosexuality, but I'll tell them it's wrong when they get home. Maybe. If I know. But you know what? I take my children to church and, you know, they can undo it there. They go to the youth group. <laughs> so, so we go to church every Sunday and so, you know what, that, that'll take care of it. You know, we'll teach them right. Careful. What carefulness. You're being careless with the lives that God has given you. He commanded you to teach your children, not to turn them over to pagans, not to turn them over to an idolatrous public system run by pagans, to teach them homosexuality. And then in the church, they, well... In the corporate church, what do they teach them? Well, you must obey the state. The law of God was nailed to the cross. Now, your new lawgiver is the state of whatever state. California. Adultery is legal. Homosexuality is A-OK. -okay. You can kill your child before it's born. You can practice birth control and abortion and anything you can get away with. Oh, so the church really can't counteract it. Be careful. What have you learned? Paul says, For behold the selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. You know what? How many people are sorrowing after a godly sort? It says, What carefulness it wrought in you. But you're careless. If you're sending your children to public fool system, if you're signing up for this and that, benefits from the state, and, and having becoming unequally yoked with unbelievers, Casting in your lot with them, having one purse with them. You're being careless. You're not being careful at all. You're just going along with the world. You are in the world and you are of it. You've got their identifications all over the place that identifies you as one of theirs. You are a resident, a thing identified of the state of whatever state you're in. <laughs> and what a state it is. Careful. Sorrowed after godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. What clearing of yourselves. You know, that's part of the coming out part. You know, we clear ourselves by coming out. We repent and we have that work of repentance. Worketh repentance going on. That clears us. Yes. What indignation. I'm indignant about the things and the entanglements of the world. What indignation. I'm indignant about having children taught homosexuality. I'm indignant about the abortion, and I am not going to fund it. I am not going to cast in my lot with them and have one purse with them. I'm indignant about the things that they're doing with the 92% of the profits from the insurance companies and what they're... I, I'm indignant about McDonald's and what they're supporting. I'm indignant about Disney 
and their support of homosexuality. I'm indignant about these things. I will not contribute. I'm indignant about the federal government supporting and paying for abortion in other countries. I'm indignant about the slaughter and the murder of the Iraqi people. I'm indignant about all these things and so many more. What indignation. Yea, what fear. I fear what will happen if I do not conform my life, have my life transformed into the image of the only begotten Son of God. What fear? I fear what will happen to me. I fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. Yea, what vehement desire. I desire to be transformed. I desire the things of God. I desire that you are transformed. That you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I desire to continue to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I desire to continue to be transformed into the image of the only begotten Son of God. I desire to have His law written on my heart that I might not sin against Him. I desire to live my life in a way that's pleasing to Him. I desire to be His man and for Him to be my God. What vehement desire Yea, what zeal I am zealous to accomplish all of these things for his name's sake. I am zealous to bring as many people into his kingdom as possible. Yea, what revenge. What revenge? Oh, vindication, retribution, punishment. They punished. What revenge. And how in pol politically incorrect. You know, we read the story in the scripture about, oh, say, Haman being hung on his own gallows. What revenge! Wonderful. What revenge! And we read the stories about uh, how people are punished by God, even by death. And we think, what revenge! What retribution! Yes, they deserved it. And we'll have to discuss this a little bit more. What revenge! This may get a little politically incorrect for you. You're listening to Cross the Border. We'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossthebordered.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book. The rapture will be canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org.
Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border. And uh, as I was leaving, I said, this could get a little politically incorrect. But I thought, did I really say that? Because <laughs> what is politically correct about anything I say? You know? But uh, speaking of uh, some things that are current in the news, which I don't like to do very often, but you'll find occasionally once every couple of years in America that uh, somebody will gun down a famous abortion doctor. And so we find that happens every once in a while. And then you, then I watch the spin-off of all of the people in the world denying it. And I come across this verse here, Yea, what revenge! And I read the story about this one abortion doctor who was, uh, who was gunned down here recently. Don't know anything about the man who gunned him down. And uh, I certainly am not advocating anyone taking the law into their own hands. It's not my position. Um, you know, uh, God Almighty, he has a pretty good hand on the universe. So I'll leave that in his capable hands. Um, but the law of God says that, uh, that at the hand of man, uh, life shall be required for man. Uh, of course, the affirmation and proclamation of capital punishment. Uh, we have the capital punishment statute. If a man murders another man, or thou shalt not kill, we have, we have a case law in the scripture for that to explain the, how, that, how that works, to explain what killing in that instance is, and it's, it's murder premeditated murder. However, there is an exception to that. Uh, it is not murder in time of war. It is not murder in self-defense. The scripture gives us all of this. Um, it's not murder if it's an accident, if it's accidental. And it's not murder if it's capital punishment. So we get back to the guy, someone who killed a, a murderer who has murdered thousands or hundreds of, uh, I don't know, thousands, hundreds of children before they were born or as they were being born. Uh, it doesn't matter where you murder somebody, it's still murder. But see, the law of man allows it, so it's not murder by the law of man, but it's still murder by the law of God. And that this man was allowed to live this long, well, was the mercy of God because he had the opportunity to repent as long as he lived. But uh, most people say, from what I've heard, the man did never repent it. But I was reading an article about the man, and he was an usher in his church. And his wife sang in the choir. Now let me ask you something. Paul is writing to the church at, in Corinthians here. Do you think that according to what Paul is saying about this church here, what revenge, what zeal, what vehement desire, and all of these things, because they they repented of allowing this to exist in their congregation. They put out the ones that were doing the evil. I wonder how this church would match up with Paul's words here. I don't think they would match up at all, would they? It says these things, what revenge in all these things, in all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. You know, that church is just as guilty as that man. They should have stood up a long time before and put that man out of their congregation. And then they should have warned all the churches of the wickedness of that man and his family. Have the audacity to be an usher in a church at the same time murdering unborn children, justifying it by the law of man, breaking the law of God. Murder, because that's what it is, murder. But then again, you know, probably that church that he attended preaches that the law of God was nailed to the cross and we don't have to follow God's law anymore. Therefore, the highest law is now the law of man. So I guess that's, they can, it's fine then that uh, he's a murderer by God's law, but he's not a murderer by man's law. So since he's been exonerated by man's law, since he has license to murder, from man, which license he does not get from the scripture, it's okay because God's law was nailed to the cross. That's right. Nailed to the cross. So we don't have to obey it anymore. So I guess it's, he's not really a murderer. 
And uh, what do I say about the guy that executed him? I don't know anything about the man that executed him. They're not letting him speak. Of course, he's become a, a, a martyr for the cause of legalized murder, abortion. The doctor has. He was an old man. He wasn't young. But he deserved to die much sooner. He should have been put to death many, many years ago for the crime of murder, according to the law of God, but not according to the law of man. Now, he, he got off easy. But you know what? He was allowed to live longer than he should have. I rejoice that this murderer is dead. Yes, I rejoice that this murderer is dead. Um, if God's people would not suffer murderers to live in this land, then, uh, well, we'd have a lot less murdering going on. If, God, if, P, if God's people executed God's law and put to death murderers, but you know what I see? I see the church backing off from this revenge. Now, I don't know why the man did it. You know, maybe God told him to do it. And maybe this man said, but God, if I do this, they're going to put me in prison and perhaps execute me. Who am I to say that God would not tell a man to execute another man and even do it under pain of suffering the consequences in his mortal flesh for breaking the law of man? God asked men to do it all the time. Peter said, we must obey God rather than man. Yahshua, he obeyed the Father. It cost him everything. It cost him his life. Most of the, many of the apostles, many, all of the martyrs, they disobeyed the civil government to obey the law of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego might have cost them their lives, but they said, we will not bow down to the law of man and put it before the law of God. We have examples in the Old Testament. We have examples in the New Testament. We have 2,000 years of examples in the martyrs of the people of the book, of people who disobeyed unlawful, tyrannical authority, governments that stepped outside of their mandate from God. Remember, their mandate is to punish evildoers and protect the rights of the people. That all men are created equal, so therefore all men have equal rights. No man, every man should love his neighbor as himself, because after all, we are all equal. And that's what the government is to protect, our life, our liberty, and our property, according to the law of God, and to punish evildoers. When they step outside of that, and they try to exert their law above God's law, then... We have license from God to disobey man's law. However, at the same time, we have to realize that obedience to God may come with consequences from man. We may perjure for righteousness' sake, as Rahab did when she lied to the police that came to her door and said, have you seen those, those children, those Hebrew men? And she lied, she hid them, and she helped them escape. She disobeyed the authority. If she had got caught, it could have cost her her life. It could have cost her everything. But she obeyed, she put the law of God above the law of man. I don't know anything about the man or the men who have executed these murderers, abortion doctors. Oh, can you, the blood money that that man gave to that church. That congregation should be ashamed They've taken blood money. If they've taken, oh, you, God, put them out, man. Put them out. What's wrong with you people? Put the evil doers out. You don't want their blood money. This thought just popped into my mind, the blood money that that church accepted from that doctor. If he tithed, and I'm sure he did, he wanted to be justified somehow. So he probably followed all the rules according to the law of the, the church that he was going to. I'm sure they... Uh, preached on tithing once in a while. That's one of God's law that they don't want to do away with. Of course, they do distort that one so that you have to give money to their corporation. But yes, our Heavenly Father may, he could call anyone at any time to execute his law or to do something that would go against the law of man. So I, can't, I couldn't stand up with all of these ministries that are standing up and condemning this act. I would have to remain neutral on it because I do not know 
if this man was being obedient to God or not, or whether he was just a madman. And if he was just a madman, well, perhaps it was God's will to end that man's life, as if uh, he was walking through the woods and got slaughtered by a tiger or hit by a Mack truck, you know. It was God's will, definitely, that that man die. But the man who took his life, I don't know. I've heard nothing. I can't make a judgment, and I'm not willing to. But I'll tell you what, I know where that doctor is, and I know that he is suffering terribly now. I know that every good thing has been withdrawn from him, because there is no evidence that he ever repented of his evil work and all of the murders that he committed. Can you imagine the evil that he done being inflicted upon him for eternity? Can you imagine him being cut up and sliced and diced and, and suctioned for eternity in hell, suffering in brimstone in a fire that is never quenched? Can you imagine the terror that he inflicted on those children and him having to feel that terror? Yes, that's the evil that he created with his life. That's the evil that he did for mammon, for his god mammon. Could you imagine being that doctor forever, having no good thing, only experiencing the evil that he created in his life? What a terrible, terrible torment that man will have to suffer forever. Fear? Yes, we should fear. And all of you that are for abortion, you should fear. Do you really want to suffer for an act that others are committing just because you want to support them? For what? For an ideology? <laughs> no, you justify others because you want to continue in your wickedness and your idolatry. What revenge? So I rejoice that that man is dead and finally suffering the consequences of his sin. I rejoice that he cannot practice the evil of legalized murder any longer. And I, I, I rejoice that his profession is becoming a rare one in the land. And not rare, rare enough until it's abolished, till it's outlawed even by the law of man. It's not to say that it won't exist. Yes, it existed before. It was legal, but not. Not to the degree once the government says that, hey, it's okay, you can do it. You have a right. Since when does evil become right? No one has a right to do evil because evil can never be right. What revenge in all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter? Wherefore, continuing here with, our, with Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Wherefore, though I wrote, you, wrote unto you, I did not for this cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed when joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. And, and his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you all, in you in all things. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do, to wit, of the grace of God, bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave of their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus 
that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also of that which you have. For if there be a first, if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according that to that man hath, and not according to that he hath not. And uh, Paul is uh, in our King James version here. It gets a little wordy. I think I'm just going to get some uh, little clarification from our friend Henry, because as I read it, I understand what's going on, but I think uh, Henry will clarify it uh, much better. Like I said, sometimes it just, it seems as though I'm reading a code that is not a plain, it's not plain English like, like I would speak if I were going to say the same things to someone today. I guess that's the way I need to put it. Uh, Henry says in 2 Corinthians, chapter 8, he says, in this and the following chapter, Paul is exhorting and directing the Corinthians about a particular work of charity to relieve the necessities of the poor saints at Jerusalem and in Judea, according to the good examples of the churches in Macedonia. Now, I just, I did, that's what I just read, <laughs> if you didn't get that. And I understood it, but you see what our good friend Henry put in one sentence there, which we got in about, you know, 15 verses there in chapter 8. Uh, Henry gets a little more to the point. But the point is this. Let's go back to the time that Paul was writing this letter and the times that were happening, what was going on in Jerusalem and Judea. Uh, this was after Daniel's 70th week had been completed and the gospel went to the nations, of course, and we see that, that the word of God now being transmitted in the language, in the Greek language, in the language of the nations, being ripped away, the oracles of God being ripped away from uh, the, the Jews, as we call them today, or the, uh, the Isra Israel, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, the oracles of God being ripped away from them and given to the nations and coming out of the nations in the international language at the time, which was Greek. That's a mouthful. So going back to the time, the end of the Daniel 70th week, the time that had been determined for thy people Israel, uh, Daniel being very sorrowful, seeing the end of his nation, and, uh, and so sorrowful that it made him sick. He dearly loved his people. If you go back to his prayer for his people, and uh, how they were restored, how the temple was rebuilt and leading up to this time and the end of his 70 weeks and the desolation that was determined is coming upon Israel. Now, our Heavenly Father, very merciful to, to national Israel in that he did not immediately, he gave them 40 years to repent. He gave his people, those, the people of the book, the people that accepted the Messiah, those that were faithful in Israel, uh, he specifically told them when you see certain things that you are to flee the land. So they had time to flee. But you have turmoil, tumult. You have persecution arising. You have a land that is preparing for total annihilation and desolation. You have unrest. You have financial turmoil. That's what's going on. And so you have people that are not doing well in Jerusalem and Judea. So Paul here is calling on the Corinthians 
to follow the example of the Macedonians in their giving, in their charity for the people in the land, because everything has been disrupted. The, the church in Jerusalem and in Judea, they're, they're preparing to flee, those that are obedient to the word of the Messiah. Uh, they have to abandon their homes and their lands and their jobs and everything. And, they're, and as, the church, as the scripture says, they had all things in common because many of them probably left in groups to travel together and they had all things in common and they sold everything to have everything in common. This wasn't, uh, the, the Bible wasn't upholding communism. We have to take this in the time context and what they were preparing for in Jerusalem and in Judea. And we need to understand that. So Paul, for this reason, is calling on the Corinthians to be as charitable as the Macedonians. So we'll pick up here next time on Cross the Border. And as always, in everything you do, everything you say, let your life bless His holy name. Hallelujah.